Good evening, I'm Andrew Chang, and this is The National. Flying to the U.S. just got more bothersome. I think it's already pretty strict enough with the security. <laughs> so what are they making you do now? Alberta chokes on smoke from B.C. fires. It really affects our ability to go outside. And the filthy cloud doesn't stop there. There was black mold pretty much in all the living quarters, like in the corners and stuff like that. The Navy changes its tune about the health hazards of moldy ships. We'll look at what it might cost to fix. Plus, a hateful message stirs fear at the Quebec City Mosque where Muslims were gunned down. So people who come to tell us, don't worry, be happy, there's no Islamophobia, it's not true. Long, slow security lines are just one frustration with air travel. And if you're planning a trip to the United States that includes flying, we've got news that you need to know but maybe don't want to hear. From now on, anyone flying to the U.S. is subject to enhanced security measures. It'll likely mean longer lines at the airport, but with an upside. Stephanie Skanderis explains. For anyone traveling to the United States, long goodbyes may be a thing of the past because this is what's now greeting passengers. Signs announcing new security measures in place because of U.S. homeland security. At Toronto's Pearson Airport, some frustration. I think it's already pretty strict enough with the security. <laughs> Coming from Europe, where I live, where there's more um, calls for security alerts, we don't have all of this. But most travelers were on board. Keeps me safe, I'm happy. I don't know if it's a foolproof, but it's something that has to be done. You may not notice much of the increased security measures, but anyone flying to the United States can now expect enhanced overall passenger screening, including more advanced technology and more sniffer dogs, and notably increased screening of personal electronic devices. Passengers won't have to hand over passwords or unlock their device, but if it's larger than a smartphone, it needs to be accessible, out of its case, and fully charged. They are justified. This security expert sees why the changes are necessary. If we look at uh, terrorist interest in airlines and aircraft, it's consistent across all kinds of terrorist groups, it's consistent across decades, it reappears again and again and again. These new measures were put in place so passengers on flights from Canada can continue to carry laptops on board. But experts say get used to long wait times and security lines because once new security measures are implemented, they're likely to stick around. Stephanie Skanderis, CBC News, Toronto. Now, as Stephanie mentioned, changes to airport security tend to be permanent. And most have come about because of terrorist threats. CATSA, the Canadian Air Transport Security Authority, was created directly after 9-11. Until then, airport security was the responsibility of the airlines. But immediately after the attacks, knives and other sharp objects were banned from hand luggage. And you may remember, after a failed attack with shoe bombs later that year on a transatlantic flight, footwear had to be removed to go through security. That's the one thing that has changed back, by the way. Travelers in Canada can now keep shoes on, unless you're flying to the U.S., Liquids were restricted in hand luggage starting in 2006 after British police thwarted a plot using explosives disguised as soft drinks. And in 2010, Canadian airports were equipped with full body scanners for a closer look at passengers singled out for additional screening. The Quebec City Mosque, where six men were shot dead in January, has once again become the site of targeted hate. Last week, a mysterious package landed on its doorstep. The CBC's Justin Hayward tells us what was inside and why the mosque kept it quiet until now. This mosque is no stranger to hate. In January, a gunman shot six people to death just after prayers. And now we're learning about an anonymous package delivered last week to the mosque's door, a shock to the mosque's president, Mohamed Labidi. We're trying to believe, he says, that only a few people are responsible for all this trouble. Inside the package, a Quran with the word Allah cut up with a blade, pictures of pigs, which Muslims don't eat, and an unwelcome suggestion. If you want a place to bury your filthy bodies, it says, here's a perfect location, a hog farm. There is no Muslim cemetery in Quebec City. Muslims have been seeking a good location for years. They had a deal to build one in this Quebec City suburb, but on the weekend, those plans were scuttled when local residents voted against it. 
The mosque received the package on Friday, but kept it secret, afraid of how people might react just days before the cemetery vote. Imam Hassan Guillet was at the mosque last night, sitting with survivors of the shooting when they learned they were again the target of hate. And some of the wounded people are in the mosque. So for us it's very emotional, very important, very human. And to come to that particular mosque, in particular, to deliver a parcel like that, it's, it's very appalling. It's not the only hateful incident Muslims at this mosque have experienced. Last year, before the shooting, someone left a pig's head on the doorstep with the message, Bon Appetit. It's more than troubling, it's unacceptable and repulsive. Uh, we should all condemn these, these acts. In Quebec City today, the Prime Minister reminded Quebecers of the outpouring of support in the wake of the mosque attack. I saw myself how 10, uh, 10, over 10,000 people came out uh, in the streets uh, to recognize that that uh, hateful act uh, did not represent uh, Quebecers or Canadians. As for the cemetery, many say they want the province to step in because the little town can't solve its bigger religious divisions on its own. Justin Hayward, CBC News, Montreal. Now we should note, in Montreal, police have established an entire unit dedicated to investigating hate crimes. So earlier this evening, I had a chance to touch base with Lieutenant Detective Lynn LeMay, who leads that unit. Now, uh, Lieutenant Detective LeMay, I'm curious to know, you, your unit has been in operation for just over a year now. And so I'm curious to know, what have you noticed, especially since the deadly Quebec City mosque attack in January, in terms of the number of incidents that people are reporting? Well, for sure, uh, since the creation of the uh, unit, uh, we can see that the numbers, the number of crimes, uh, a crime reported, and also incident, because there, we make the difference between a crime and an incident, which is a non-criminal uh, event that happened. Uh, we can see the numbers that uh, that have uh, really increased. Uh, and since the uh, shooting at the mosque in Quebec, uh, we saw that there was a lot more uh, num of reported. And, and it's interesting that you make that distinction because my understanding of the way your unit works is that anything that could even be construed as a, a hateful uh, act or a hateful behavior is something that you would investigate. So, so tell me, what does that actually look like in practice? Well, in practice, let's say someone uh, s says uh, insult uh, to a person regarding his uh, sexual orientation or uh, et ethnicity or religion. Or this is an incident. This is not criminal. But we we're, we're gonna we're gonna investigate this uh, incident as well. We're gonna try to support the person who dealt with it because sometimes this uh, sense of safety will be really affected. So we, we're gonna try to support this person and we're gonna try to uh, work work with the person who did that to make sure that it's not going to become a crime later on. And, and very preventative approach. Uh, Lieutenant Detective LeMay, thanks for joining us here in the program. You're welcome. Now in BC, as fires continue to burn, evacuees are asking the question, when can we go home? The BC Wildfire Service is showing active and huge fires across Cache Creek, around Williams Lake, and throughout the McAllister area. That's on top of a number of smaller but fierce fires still burning throughout the central interior. Now, many of the evacuees fled far north to Prince George, and that's where we find the CBC's Cameron McIntosh. There's a smoky haze in the sky here over Prince George, where now more than 8,300 people are registered as evacuees, most of them from the area in and around Williams Lake, which accounts for nearly half of the almost 50,000 evacuees currently in this province. And today, most of them didn't get any closer to finding out when they're going to get to go home. While fire crews are making progress on some of the most threatening fires, including the ones near Williams Lake, they don't have them under control, and it's not clear when they will. But with that uncertainty comes a little bit of help. Today, on his first full day on the job, BC's new Premier John Horgan extended the state of emergency here. That's significant because it extends evacuee benefits. Up until now, they were being given $600 each to help cover out-of-pocket costs. We're going to increase that, uh, that one-time payment to a second-time payment for every 14 days that people are evacuated from their homes. So a little bit more help for evacuees, but the thought of a long-term evacuation is really starting to wear on people here. And today, officials in Williams Lake did acknowledge that and they pleaded for patience, saying they understand that people need to get on with their lives. But the haze in the sky here is a reminder to everyone that these fires are still going strong.
Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Prince George. Now, where there's fire, there is smoke. And next door in Alberta, there's a real fear of people getting sick from that toxic soup in the air wafting over. Our Carolyn Dunn spoke with people who are doing their best to stay safe. A haze hangs over much of Alberta, a curtain of smog courtesy forest fires west of here, prompting an air quality advisory for much of central and southern Alberta. Karen Godell doesn't need the advisory to know the air is thick with smoke. She and her 13-year-old daughter both suffer chronic lung disease and asthma. Ups our need to have medications and it affects our ability to just move around in our daily lives. Nick Oxford is an apprentice bricklayer with asthma who's relying on his inhaler to get him through his outdoor shifts. It's mostly just tightness of the throat. Like it feels like you're getting sick. Um, like it burns too. He'll likely find it even harder to breathe over the next 24 hours. This Environment Canada map shows how the smoke is blowing from west to east. The red, that smoke full of health endangering particulates, will continue to blow over Alberta. But the lighter smoke won't stop there. Strong upper winds will blow it all the way to northern Quebec and Nunavut. Even before the smoke peaks, many are adjusting their outdoor activities. I can taste, uh, sort of get a taste in my mouth a little bit. I can just feel like I don't want to breathe deeply, but I want to get my exercise. We stopped Caitlin Cooper on her 30 kilometer bike ride because of the bandana over her face and found she's taking it easier too. I was just kind of <laughs> meandering with one hand on, going slow. Alberta's chief medical officer says as the conditions worsen, precautions should increase. If they do notice uh, haze, uh, smell smoke, they should uh, minimize their physical activity outdoors, uh, keep their doors and windows closed as much as they can. If there is a bit of good news, it's in the weather forecast. Environment Canada expects some rain Thursday afternoon or evening, perhaps enough to clear the air for a spell. Carolyn Dunn, CBC News, Calgary. Coming up, the Governor General gets noticed in London for cool socks and a breach of royal etiquette. Plus, thousands line up in St. John's for a charity jackpot. Then, the police were called in. Well, U.S. Senator John McCain has been diagnosed with brain cancer. His office made the announcement after the 80-year-old Republican had a blood clot removed from above his left eye. McCain's doctors say he is recovering from his surgery and his underlying health is excellent. The senator and his family are reviewing their treatment options. The Navy is testing the air on its warships after getting a number of complaints about mold in the ventilation systems. The CBC News first raised concerns last year, but back then the military said it had no reports of health issues. Well now, a former sailor is speaking out, saying he got sick while serving his country. Murray Brewster reports. Mold, it's gross, it's ugly, and it's unsafe. She said it looked like you were like a canary in the coal mine. Retired Lieutenant Alan Dusat served aboard two Canadian destroyers, HMCS Athabascan and HMCS Iroquois, between 2006 and 2009, and he came away sick. They said it was just a seasonal flu, chest cold, whatever they wanted to chalk it up to. But it was more than that, and he began to look around for a cause. There was black mold pretty much in all the living quarters, like in the corners and stuff like that. It looked like somebody used black spray paint and just, you know, mist or whatever. His illness was diagnosed as hyperactive airway disorder, brought on by exposure to mold and diesel fumes, something Veterans Affairs now recognizes as the reason his naval career ended in 2012. I am not aware of any uh, long-term reports of any kind of illness uh, associated with mold. Last year, CBC News reported on mold and air quality concerns aboard the warships. And this was, at the time, the Navy's official line. We have absolutely no concern about the mold in the ships. But now, it's this. We've had a, an ongoing concern with mold in the, in the frigates now since we entered into the, uh, the pre-work for the modernization program. That modernization project was a $4.3 billion multi-year refit of the Navy's 12 frigates. The program did not include an upgraded ventilation system despite previous mold concerns. The Navy is now being forced to retrofit those changes into each ship, costing taxpayers 
$50 million. So every indication that we have today is that it is worked to improve the system. But they aren't entirely sure. DND has deployed a hazardous health assessment team to HMCS Winnipeg. It will conduct specialized air quality tests between now and the end of the month. Eventually, all warships will be checked, in addition to day-to-day -day assessments. For air quality monitoring, uh, we have our physician assistants on board who always conducts air quality monitoring. So to test just how diligent the Navy has been on a day-to-day -day basis, CBC News asked under access to information for copies of previous air quality tests and health assessments related to mold on warships. Nine months later, and we're still waiting. Marie Brewster, CBC News, Ottawa. Canada's premiers and territorial leaders have wrapped up three days of talks, but they're going home without having reached a consensus on one pressing topic, marijuana. The deadline towards legalization is ticking closer, and there are still major concerns. Catherine Cullen has more from Edmonton. We need to make sure that uh, we do everything in our power to get it right, and we have one chance to get it right. Manitoba's premier might be the most vocal about his concerns around legalizing pot. But all the politicians in this room know they have mountains of work to do, from deciding where to sell it to how much to charge, all before the federal government's July 2018 deadline. Manitoba had hoped to convince other provinces to ask for a one-year extension, but they aren't, at least not yet. Premiers around this table agreed that should the federal government not engage adequately on these issues, we will need more time. What they want right now is a lot more information on everything from how the pot distribution network will work to plans for beefing up road safety to deal with drug drivers. These issues have to be addressed by the federal government in order for us to meet that deadline. Just as the premiers were speaking in Edmonton, the Prime Minister was in Quebec City, being asked by reporters if he would consider extending that deadline. We're still looking at summer of 2018 as uh, the time where the uh, legalized framework will come into play right across the country. That's super duper. Now, he needs to then uh, uh, hear what the premiers of uh, his country, our country, have said we need help with. The provinces say they'll coordinate with each other too. And some who share a border say they're very concerned about issues like setting different age limits. And we're working towards having as common a framework as we can have. There were actually a few funny moments, like when the hotel's resident dog wandered into the news conference, only to be escorted out. But some are asking whether any of the premiers really needs to attend meetings like this in the age of Skype and FaceTime. Trying to uh, manage the uh, energetic, uh, thoughtful, focused uh, input of uh, all th 13 people in the room over Skype or on the phone would have been um, a nightmare that I would have um, run screaming from. Manitoba's Premier says Canada is like a family and if your family only chooses to meet over Skype, you probably don't like each other very much. We have to work at liking each other, he said, and that's why we get together. Though it is worth noting, they only do that once or twice a year. Catherine Cullen, CBC News, Edmonton. Well, the company that makes OxyContin has agreed to pay $20 million to Canadians who got hooked on its painkiller. It settles a class action lawsuit filed on behalf of patients who were prescribed the opioid by their doctors. As many as 1,500 people will get paid. And stick around, because... A little later, we're going to zero in on Portugal's opioid addiction problem and look at how they managed to gain the upper hand in that fight. That's in about 10 minutes' time. Well, Karim Baratov, the Canadian accused of being part of a cyber attack against Yahoo, is planning to fight U.S. authorities. They want him tried there for hacking and espionage. Well, at this point, uh, I'm standing firm uh, to challenge the extradition. Baratov's lawyer says he's also trying to negotiate an agreement with the Americans, but will fight extradition if they can't reach a deal by the next hearing date, September 8th. A freight train derailed this morning in Strathroy, Ontario, just west of London. The good news, no one was hurt. The other good news, the train wasn't carrying anything dangerous. Paper and soybeans, we're told. But there are cancellations in passenger service between Sarnia and Toronto. And check your fridges. Two more brands of yogurt have been added to a nationwide recall. We're talking about some batches and flavors of Yoplait Mini Go and Liberté Greek yogurts. 
The concern is there could be pieces of plastic in them. You can find a full list of the affected products online. Just head to cbcnews.ca and click on the Canadian Food Inspection Agency's recall details. And straight ahead, the British press gives Canada's Governor General a very public lesson in royal protocol. America's agony is growing darker, going deeper, and dividing its people as only the Civil War did in the past. Richard Nixon is a shrunken president, a man clinging to a power that is dwindling daily. I welcome this kind of examination because people have got to know whether or not their president is a crook. Well, I'm not a crook. If the many allegations made to this day are true, then the burglars who broke into the headquarters of the Democratic National Committee at the Watergate were in effect breaking into the home of every citizen of the United States. Republican support for President Nixon on the House Judiciary Committee was clearly collapsing today. That Richard Nixon, Nixon has, beyond a reasonable doubt, committed impeachable offenses. We have direct evidence coming out of the mouth of the President of the United States that he not only condoned, but he directed these cover-up operations. At what point did President Nixon corruptly abuse the IRS? I have never been a quitter, but as President, I must put the interests of America first. Therefore, I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. He's ever seen him. There is the president waving goodbye. Can you hear the applause? Good evening. The president of the United States has been impeached. In a series of four votes, the Republican-dominated House supported two articles of impeachment, alleging Clinton obstructed justice and lied under oath about his sexual affair with Monica Lewinsky. I did not have sexual relations with that woman. The Monica Lewinsky sex scandal dominated the U.S. political scene for one year and one month, precipitating the impeachment trial. That ended today in a matter of minutes. U.S. President William Jefferson Clinton was acquitted on two articles of impeachment. Not guilty. Aides said Clinton didn't even bother watching the historic votes. Afterwards, though, he made one more apology for his misconduct before appealing to everyone to move on. This can be, and this must be, a time of reconciliation and renewal for America. The outgoing Governor General was in London today, where he met with the Queen at Canada House. That's your standard recipe for a by-the-books visit. But one little faux pas had the tabloids stirring. Susan Ormiston explains. In Britain, they call this hoovering, essential preps for a visit by the Queen. Canada House was showing its best face. Even Canada's Governor General was sporting a sartorial surprise. The Queen and Prince Philip, on one of his last public events, marked two occasions with their visit, Canada's sesquicentennial and the Queen's Jubilee. The Queen is the sixth British monarch since Canadian Confederation, but given her long reign, she's watched over Canada for nearly half of its 150 years. The way she goes, we might be here for the 200th, you know? <laughs> it, she is an amazing woman. The monarchy's appeal in Canada has waxed and waned over 150 years, but Queen Elizabeth's ties with Canada are long and strong. I'm almost done my studies. Reinforced by receptions like this one with guests in the arts, sports and business, like the designers behind D-Square. And for her sapphire jubilee, a gift from Canada. We hope it serves as a reminder of the immense affection in which you were held. David Johnston presented a bejeweled snowflake brooch. It's studded with beluga sapphires from Baffin Island, a very rare and beautiful jewel, and then diamonds from Northwest Territories. And I think she was particularly struck, as was he, that these were um, gems that came from uh, the northern part of Canada. Cassie Campbell is her name. Johnston has met the Queen six or seven times, he says, in his official role, and is well-versed in protocol. 
leaving Canada House, he gently held the 91-year-old monarch's elbow as she navigated steep steps. And for that, a British paper pounced. The Daily Mail headlined, Breach of Protocol, One Must Never Touch the Queen. Well, I just was anxious to be sure that there was no stumbling on the steps. It's a little bit awkward, that descent from Canada House to uh, Trafalgar Square, and the, there's a carpet that's a little bit slippy. Palace rules actually don't dictate hands off the Queen. It's not written down anywhere. It's etiquette, and Queen Elizabeth seemed unperturbed as she bid farewell to her 11th Governor General and to Canada House on the 150th. Susan Ormiston, CBC News, London. Well, it has been three years since Malaysia Airlines Flight 370 disappeared, and all efforts to find the plane have mostly come up empty. But we're learning all that investigating had a silver lining. Detailed seafloor maps of the Indian Ocean have now been made public. It's useful data because it could help improve deep sea fishing and even tsunami preparedness. It's not often oceans get the kind of fine tooth combing that came with the search for the plane. The woman arrested in Saudi Arabia for wearing, quote, immodest clothing is now free. Police questioned and then released her without charge. Over the weekend, video of her at a heritage site sparked outrage in the kingdom, which has strict dress code laws. And in Uruguay, we're seeing the end of the country's long road to legalized marijuana. Today, citizens and permanent residents can finally buy pot over the counter in pharmacies. There is a limit, though, and customers have to register and log their fingerprints as well. Well, today, Canada's premiers talked about this country's opioid crisis. Up next, some lessons from overseas. They sent a strong message that this is first and foremost a health and social issue. Portugal managed to drastically reduce addiction to hard drugs. We'll show you how they did it. The game is space war and is played on a computer. At the moment, it provides esoteric sport for young mathematicians at MIT. Someday, it may train them to fight a war in space. <laughs> Whether it's the nice zingy sound they make, the electronic challenge, or just the thrill of controlling what happens on a television screen, TV games are exerting a powerful fascination. What do you think of the game you're playing? Oh, I love it. These students at the University of Alberta in Edmonton have developed a series of games that can be played on the computer. And the idea of the game is to manipulate the cursor towards your enemy until you get him in the center. And once you've got him there, Bang and he's dead. Defender, Asteroids, Missile Command, the names of some of the arcade hits that are attracting millions of video addicts every day. Video junkies have a current favorite. Someone even wrote a song about Pac-Man. Pac-Man grossed more money in arcades last year than the movie Star Wars, one of the most successful Hollywood films. These are not games you would find in an arcade. They are the latest generation of home video. And this is where the real boom in the industry is occurring. I don't play that much. They're really addicted to this thing. This is a story about a game. A game some say is so exciting, so enthralling, so much fun, that if you ever start playing, you won't be able to stop. Your fingers flying over buttons as you jump, fly, crush, and kill your way through an alternate reality. Alluring, fascinating, compelling. A curse. They're video games, the flashy, trashy offshoots of the computer revolution. Its programmers say we haven't seen anything yet. First, the best known of the sex change operation was one performed about 15 years ago on a young ex-GI named George Jorgensen who went to Copenhagen and came back as Christine. When Christine's story was told around the world, there were applications from hundreds of young men who wanted to undergo the same kind of operation. Well, Diana, now that you're officially a woman, how does it feel? I feel absolutely marvelous, thank you. Did you always want to be a woman? 
As long as I can remember, sir, yes. And now that you are, uh, how does it, what do you miss most about being a man? I never was really in, in intensity a man, um, or psychologically, so I miss nothing about my malehood. Lee Davis of Ottawa was born a woman. Recently, after a number of medical operations, Lee Davies became a man. I was only a kid. I felt different. I mean, I knew I wasn't, my body wasn't what my mind was saying I was. My mind was totally male. Caroline's surgery 17 years ago gave her the woman's body she dreamt of and a model's salary of $200,000 a year. No one questioned her femininity. In fact, she modeled for seven years before the British tabloids made her story public. She even played a Bond girl in a 007 film. It's only the British government that doesn't accept the change. I'm sort of classified still as a man. I mean, I break the law every day if I use the woman's toilet. I mean, I can't really use the, the men's. I mean, if I committed a crime, I'd be in a men's prison. government to engage in cross-border discussions with U.S. public health officials because they they actually have this problem as well and, and in some ways are farther along the road. When asked today about Canada's opioid crisis, Alberta Premier Rachel Notley suggested looking south for inspiration. But we have another idea. Take a look at Portugal. Not so long ago, addiction rates there were staggering. Now, the entire country has far fewer drug deaths than B.C. alone, all because they gambled on a radical solution. Here's Chris Brown with another look at Portugal's fix. Existem duas equipas e vão ter que trabalhar como equipa. In Lisbon, some of Portugal's most damaged, dependent people are trying to put their lives back together. One step at a time. This is a physiotherapy class for heroin and cocaine users, where they relearn basic skills, like skipping, as part of their rehabilitation. And statistically, there's a far greater chance they'll recover here than almost any other place in the world. That's because in Portugal, drug addiction rarely kills anyone. People arrive here and they are wounded. Psychologist Sandra Simoche oversees programs at the Typus Rehab Clinic, programs that help people rediscover joy in small things and learn to love their bodies again. We deal with them in a new way. We uh, build new relationships with them, and that is very uh, important. In all of Portugal, fewer than 30 people a year now die from drug overdoses. In British Columbia alone, hundreds die every year and the provinces struggled for decades to save lives. In 2016, after the lethal opioid fentanyl turned up, there were more than 900 deaths, creating a public health emergency and a new urgency for solutions. Arguably, no place in the world has had as much success dealing with addictions and overdoses as Portugal. Its system emphasizes harm reduction, treatment and rehabilitation. And at the center of it is the idea that drug use is a health problem, not a crime. All drugs here, from marijuana to heroin, have been decriminalized. Drug traffickers are still hunted down and prosecuted, but if you're caught using, you won't be sent to jail or get a criminal record or even end up in the justice system. Okay. Instead, you might have to appear before Nuno Capes. Bruno, pode sentar aqui deste lado, só chover. Ora, 2,53 gramas de AX, certo? 
he heads up what's known as Lisbon's Dissuasion Commission. We were allowed to sit in on one of its sessions. There are no suit or ties here, no gavels or gowns, just a sociologist in a sweater. This isn't a court, and Kappa says he's not a judge. When I wake up in the morning and come back to work, I'm, I'm not thinking on how many fines I'm going to apply or how many people I'm going to threaten to uh, make them stop using any illicit substances. So it's fairly easy for us to focus on health issues and what uh, what help we can provide people in terms of those issues. Portugal's Dissuasion Commission is essentially a form of state-mandated early intervention. On our visit, Capaz had a meeting with a young man named Bruno, who'd been caught with some hashish. The punishment for him was simply a warning, along with an offer of information about treatment programs. Capaz estimates one in ten people who appear here have a serious drug problem, and for them, this visit can be the first step in getting treatment. I think what we found out in Portugal after 15 years is that using any sort of stick or any sort of threat doesn't work. If you increase the penalties for drug users, there's the usage decrease. It doesn't. The Portuguese learned that lesson in the late 1990s when enforcement was practiced as the main solution to a horrible drug crisis. The country of 10 million people had up to 100,000 addicts. That's an astounding 1% of the population that was hooked on hard drugs. Mm, around 400 uh, uh, overdoses dead uh, every year. Desperate for change, the government turned to addictions treatment specialist, Dr. Joao Golau. You could see a uh, uh, huge uh, devastation in people. You could see people uh, walking down uh, like zombies. Golau's at the time revolutionary recommendation was to remove criminal penalties for using drugs. Portugal still doesn't sanction the sale of drugs. That's illegal. But users are not treated as criminals. It's very important because it introduced coherence in all the, in all the system. Okay, if it stands in the idea that we are dealing with a disease, a disease like the others, with the same dignity. Within a decade, the number of addicts in Portugal was cut in half. 90% of public money spent fighting drugs now goes towards treatment and prevention. Just 10% is spent on policing. In Canada, the most recent studies show the reverse, spending close to 70% on enforcement. So those are, those are like, to me, the absolute no-brainers. And Don McPherson of Simon Fraser University's Canadian Drug Policy Coalition he is one of Vancouver's best-known harm reduction advocates, and he's just back from his own survey of how Portugal practices treatment. You know, the profound thing about the, you know, the decriminalization piece is that they sent a strong message to everybody, to the public. Uh, it's politically supported that this is first and foremost a health and social issue. So it, 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 it changed the way police deal with the situation. They, know, they, they go after traffickers. Uh, they didn't legalize uh, trafficking. Um, so that would help in Canada. In Vancouver, lethal drugs like fentanyl and the 100 times more powerful car fentanyl have contaminated the supply of heroin, sending the death toll soaring. So far, Portugal has been spared that. But McPherson says should those drugs turn up, the outreach and harm reduction already happening should put the Portuguese in a better position to cope. The cornerstone of Portugal's treatment and rehab model is now outreach and engagement. We distribute to people that uh, used to um, smoke. We connected with a team as they made their daily rounds in a derelict former industrial area in East Lisbon. Boa tarde, equipa de rua. Precisam de alguma coisa? Ines and Marta are psychology graduates. Their job is to find homeless drug addicts. Two, 
They give them clean supplies so when they inject, they don't get sick, and they come to the same neighborhoods every day. Queres os toalhetes? Não, esses. Esses tens? Que as outras temos no carro. They meet the same people, they know their stories, and they provide a very human connection to the healthcare system. We met Pedro. I, I, I use a, a, a longer needle and I shoot on, on, on my leg. When we told him we were from Vancouver, that rang a bell. In Canada, I, I, I know that I saw a, a documentary and I know there's a lot of drugs uh, on this, this, this alley on the, on the city. He told us he's also aware of how many Canadians are dying from drug overdoses. And he says he appreciates the people in Lisbon who are trying to keep him alive. Their job, it's very important and they are very brave. You know, they come here, uh, uh, help people pick up the needles. Uh, they come with no security, you know, they come alone. You know, they're very brave and it's very important. They say drug war, we say no more. In Canada, harm reduction policies from safe injection sites to the Vancouver clinic that dispenses prescription heroin have been pushed by local activists and implemented against a backdrop of legal uncertainty. The result is a patchwork where Vancouver has many outreach programs, but other Canadian towns and cities have very little. In Portugal, though, help for drug addiction is as intrinsic to universal health care as hospital beds. So is treatment. This is a mobile methadone van, one of several in Lisbon that cover the city, bringing treatment to heroin addicts where they live and work. I am Elvira. I am 50 years old. And uh, I'm very happy with this program because it changed my life. Elvira Ferreira showed up while we were there. Today I, I'm, I, uh, I'm cleaning. I uh, work cleaning. Sometimes I'm uh, near this one. Sometimes I'm near another one. I go there. So it's, um, it's easy to, to get the, the methadone. Methadone is a commonly prescribed substitute for heroin. It eases withdrawal symptoms without causing the high. Well, I feel okay. I feel okay. I do my life normally. I clean my house. I uh, take care of my grandchildren. I work. I'm okay. I don't need to, to, to go to buy the drugs anymore. Methadone treatment is practiced widely, including in Canada. But what's striking is the effort the Portuguese system puts into getting it to people and taking the stigma out of using it. Despite the success stories, though, it's also evident that Portugal's system is being strained. For example, there are fewer spaces for recovering addicts in this art therapy program. Europe's financial crisis took a heavy toll here. People lost jobs. Alcoholism and addictions increased. And funding for programs was cut. Here at the Typus Clinic, a staff of 165 was reduced to 63. The government here used to spend generously helping addicts make the final transition from rehab to jobs and supporting themselves. But much of that money was cut. This flower greenhouse, about an hour outside Lisbon, received grants to employ recovering addicts. Não voltar uh, um, às drogas. Such as Joao Grasso. He's one of five workers here, but there used to be 13. He says the program provides valuable work experience and references. E comecei por, por fazer uh, tratamento aqui na Dia Nova de, de um ano, 12 meses. Um, e pronto, com a ajuda da equipa consegui uh, refazer a minha vida e, e, e começar a, a procurar trabalho no, quando acabei o programa. And we are still suffering from those cuts. Manager Rui Martins fears Portugal's success story could be at risk. We know that only treating people is not enough. If you don't provide them the skills, the job opportunity, 
uh, housing um, possibilities. Uh, the demotivation that comes after the treatment because of not having those uh, security um, facilities and environments might let them again to start using. Financial and uh, mostly the social crisis had some impacts in, in the situation. Joao Golao laments that the drug treatment system he helped create is under such strain. Nonetheless, he says it does prove that treating drug use like a health problem is the only way forward. You have our experience, okay? It worked. There is still lots of drug use in Portugal, but not as much misery and not the death. Instead, there's now understanding that progressive public policy can turn around a disaster. Chris Brown, CBC News in Lisbon. And just ahead, the long, long lineup for a shot at a million dollars. It was all for fun and charity, but then they had to call the police. Céline Dion, she's a big star in France and in her home province of Quebec. She isn't known at all in English Canada, but the young singer could change all that soon. Critics in France and Quebec have called her extraordinary, exceptional, a new international star. What amazes them is her voice and her age. Céline Dion is 15. My dream is uh, um, to be international star. Off stage, Céline Dion is not unlike most 15-year-old Quebecers. Here she struggles with her very first English interview. In, in, uh, in to be able in, uh, to sing all my life. The Dion family, it's musical and it's big. Céline is the youngest of 14 children. She sung practically since she could talk. At 12, she became professional. At 14, she won the World Song Contest in Japan. At 15, she's won a gold record in France, the first Canadian ever to do it. Now she's at the top of the European song charts. And in Montreal, in the streets or here at a baseball game, she's a celebrity. So in Quebec and Europe, she's a star. But on Young Street in Toronto, she'd hardly get a second glance. That's expected to change. Tom Kennedy, CBC News, Montreal. J'attendais ce moment depuis très longtemps. I've waited a long time for this, says Celine Dion, the reigning pop diva at a rare hometown performance in Montreal. But Montreal is not home for Dion anymore. She's nowhere long enough to unpack her bags. Every moment is given over to the business of selling Celine Dion. Ironically, the stage is her only sanctuary. I love being on stage. It's because every day, everybody's telling me what to do and talk about this and don't mention this yet and don't forget to talk about that and forget, don't forget this and, you know, don't do this, don't do that. And, but on stage, nobody has the guts to come on stage and tell me what to do.
Now, uh, I don't know how much Motorhead was playing on the loudspeakers over in St. John's today, but today was all about the Ace of Spades. Thousands of Newfoundlanders are chasing the Ace. The annual lottery is back, and with a ballooning jackpot. But tonight, a dramatic turn. The CBC's Zach Gowdy watched it all unfold. Well, with over a million dollars in prize money on the table, we were prepared for a dramatic day. In fact, you can see some of that prize money making its way out the door right now. What no one here was prepared for was what just happened tonight in Goulds. Thousands of people abruptly turned away, and tonight's Chase the Ace abruptly canceled. And the future of this event, uncertain. Now, the day began just the way we all expected, with thousands of people lining up for the chance to get rich. If you're not familiar with Chase the Ace, it is a weekly community lottery with an escalating jackpot. This would have been week 40, the prize, over a million dollars. People have been coming from far and wide for a chance to play, with some lining up as early as 6 a.m. Early bird catches worm. <laughs> but around 5 o'clock local time, things took a very different turn. Reports began to emerge of a ticket holder who had four tickets that contained duplicate numbers. Now, in the context of a lottery, duplicate numbers is about as bad as it can get. The provincial government, which licenses lotteries, sent in auditors to assess the situation. But less than an hour before game time, organizers got back on the mic to make this announcement live to the crowd. We will be uh, having the draw, um, we're not sure when, but hopefully within the next day or two. Some of us guys got to go back to the mainland, and we just got ripped off 50 bucks, right? Not happy. drag, but that's it. What happens now? No one can say. Chase the Ace organizers are telling people only to hang on to their tickets. What's at stake? Well, you can see it right there. Millions of dollars in prizes, some of it available for a potential jackpot. Several million already has been raised for the St. Kevin's Parish Association. Hey, we were ready for drama, right? Seems like the drama of this Chase the Ace will continue. Zach Gowdy, CBC News, in Goulds, Newfoundland and Labrador. And when we come back, a certain kind of wine is enjoying a global upswing. And it turns out Canada has a natural advantage for making it. We'll tell you more. But first, here are the day's business numbers. The TSX gained 95 points. The dollar increased two tenths of a cent. In New York, the Dow hit a record high and the price of oil edged up 73 cents. I'm Pia Chattopadhyay. Tomorrow on The Current, the flying car was a fixture in the 1960s cartoon series, The Jetsons. But transport companies are finally scrambling to populate the skies with personal flying machines. That's on The Current, weekdays at 8.30 on Radio 1. This afternoon in St. John's, Newfoundland, a young man named Terry Fox started running. Many people have run or walked across Canada, but Fox hopes to be the first to do it with an artificial leg. I got a lot of positive attitude and I think I can do it. He calls his running style the Foxtrot. After 25 days in Newfoundland, Terry had raised $25,000. That song was commissioned by the Cancer Society, which had its own doubts when he started off. Now, as he pounds out the kilometers, the money pours in, most of it in cash. He's got all the guts in the world, and I wish him all the luck in the world, too, and I hope he makes it. What do you think of Terry Fox? I think he's great. He'll make it. He'll make it. The run to City Hall, down University Avenue, took Terry by hundreds of people. It was an emotional moment for many of them. I knew I was going to make 20 miles, but when people were out there like that, it was incredible today. We've seen him surrounded by crowds of supporters, but the crowds go home. Terry keeps running. I'm stubborn and competitive, and I, I don't know, I, I really enjoy life. I enjoy challenges. I don't like people feeling sorry for me. I don't like pity, and I wanted to show these other people what I could do. The National with Norton Nash. Good evening. A story of incredible courage came to an end today. At a news conference. Yesterday I was running and I had noticed a little bit of hardness in breathing. And I, had to, I decided I had to go see the doctor. And it was discovered then that the cancer had spread. And now I've got cancer in my lungs. And uh... From one end of the country to the other, there has been a spontaneous outpouring of support for Terry Fox and cancer research. 
Rarely, if ever, have so many people been so deeply moved by one individual. If it comes to the point where I'm told I'm going to die of cancer, I haven't got a chance, I've got to be able to face that. And Good evening. Terry Fox died this morning in a British Columbia hospital, one month before his 23rd birthday. Well, he was a very brave boy, I must say, and I feel very, very sad about it. Don't cry, love. It's all right. Don't cry, sweetie. It's all right. I think he touched the hearts of a lot of Canadians, and they all really look up to him. More than our sympathy, we would like you to express as well our profound gratitude for the gift which Terry gave to all of us the gift of his own boundless courage and hope. Canadians everywhere walked and jogged and ran to raise money for the fight against cancer. He accomplished more in a few short months than most of us can hope for in a lifetime. A surf competition in South Africa was interrupted by an ominous sighting, a great white shark. It was spotted yesterday by World Surf League patrollers near Jeffreys Bay, which is known for its big waves and big predators. And they have good reason to worry. In 2015, a surf contestant was actually attacked, but fortunately not hurt. Today, though, it was back to business as usual with competitors returning to the surf. Meantime, in Wales, there was a dramatic rescue on their shores. People spotted a beached dolphin, and it was a group effort from the Coast Guard, Animal Rescue Services, and locals to keep it hydrated and eventually lift it by stretcher back into the sea. And here's a site that's very familiar to Canadians, but this ain't Canada. It's Brazil. In the southern hemisphere, July is winter. And just look at all that freezing rain covering poles, cars, and the ground in ice. In some parts of the country, it felt like minus 17 degrees with the wind chill. Okay, uh, it is bubbly, popular as a summer drink, and now makes up a tenth of wine sales around the world. Sparkling wine is in greater demand, and Canadian growers from coast to coast are getting on board. Ron Charles gives us a tour. Deep in the cellars under the Chateau de Charme winery, workers perform a complicated and laborious task called the traditional method to make wine that sparkles. For the method developed in France's Champagne region, winemakers add yeast to already bottled wine to ferment it a second time. That yeast creates the bubbles. Winery president Paul Bosk explains one of the final steps, flash freezing the bottlenecks years later to get the spent yeast out. Until it creates an ice cube inside the bottle. And inside that ice cube, you have trapped the, the yeast. Bosque says Chateau de Charmes started making sparkling wine three decades ago, but it's recently really taken off. We've not only expanded our production, but have introduced more styles of sparkling wine to address that interest. That's the sound of the newest trend in wine, Corks popping on sparkling wine on a Wednesday afternoon, not at a wedding or other special occasion. One in ten of the bottles of wine sold in the world is now sparkling. Wine educator and writer Tony Aspler says many of Canada's 600 wineries have realized they are perfectly suited to grow grapes used in sparkling wine. If you have limestone, which we do, uh, that is perfect for growing Pinot Noir and for Chardonnay. And so we have the temperature too. Aspler says BC leads the pack with the most sparkling wine production, closely followed by Ontario's wine regions, with Nova Scotia and Quebec also getting into bubbles. Winemakers can become quite attached to the complicated sparkling wines they make. Ontario's Taz Winery makes such small batches of its new sparkling rosé, it's only available at the winery. That is, until it's sold out. So we use the tanks. Winemaker the... Rene Van Eed calls it a labor yeah. of love. As a winemaker coming forward, it's so many steps, so many little achievements, so many things to watch uh, for that it, it's a great achievement to pop that bottle at the end of the day <laughs> and enjoy the fruits of your labor. That's clearly something to which many more people have been raising a glass. 
Ron Charles, CBC News, Niagara on the lake. Hmm. Can't wait to go back home to Vancouver now. Uh, that's The National for this Wednesday night. Thanks so much for joining us for news at any hour. You can always go to our website, cbcnews.ca. I'm Andrew Chang. Take care.